Okay, I think we're there. Let me just double check. Can you guys hear me okay? Let me know if you guys can hear me all right in the chat. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another Astro Coffee Hangout. My name is Tony Darnell. I finally got it started. It took me nine minutes. Don't know what was going on of pushing buttons to get the stream to start for YouTube. Started everywhere else, but YouTube, once again, has let me down. Bad YouTube. Anyway, welcome back, everybody. I'm Tony Darnell from DeepAstronomy.Space, and today we're going to be draw talking about white dwarf stars, the death of our sun, the future of the death of our sun is awaits us in this conversation. This is how our sun will die, and we'll talk about what white dwarfs are, electron degeneracy, more than you're ever going to want to know <laughs> about that. Uh, and we're also going to talk about some interesting research that was done by Matt Kaplan, my guest today from the Illinois State University. He's an astronomer there, a theoretical astronomer, I think they call him now. I'm going to have to clarify that with him here in just a minute. But anyway, uh, let me uh, let me pull up Matt. Hiya, Matt. Are you there? Hey, yeah, long time no see. Can only go up from here. Uh, after That's tech failure. Uh, anything else is small potatoes that, compared to that. It's YouTube, man. YouTube lets me down. It's just, uh, we're it just, all here now. And that's what yes, counts. That's what matters. So I don't know if you could just hear what I said about that introduction, but are you a theoretical astronomer? So I only say I'm an astronomer when I want to talk to the guy next to me on a plane. Otherwise I say, <laughs> uh, ah. If, yeah. I, if I need to use the most magnificent sounding title I could give myself, I go for a theoretical nuclear astrophysicist or something yeah. out as many words. <laughs> but I have never used a telescope in my life. Uh, I've, uh. I only look at computer screens. I, I hear you. And I, I, I can't tell you how many professional astronomers I've worked with over the years uh, at various uh, facilities and institutes. And they don't they couldn't find the Big Dipper if you beg them. So I can yeah, do they, that one. Okay, you do I that can, one. Okay. I can do that one. <laughs> and I know how to find Sirius from Orion's belt, too. Ah, okay, good. So you can. Can you arc to Arcturus? Ooh, that is above my pay grade. Maybe yeah. See? See? In, nice uh, guy. Nice guy. That. Basic 101 stuff. Yeah. Spike to Spica. Maybe people can't do that either. So, yeah. So, and, and that's really interesting because I know we're going to talk about white dwarfs, but, but there really is no difference. Back me up on this, Matt. Between an astronomer and an astrophysicist, is there? You know, I think you asked me this before. I did. I did. I, I think I'm going to tell you the same thing, which is that I think astronomers are photographers, and I think astrophysicists are the scientists who think more about the model. Like, I know that's not too fair to all my astronomer friends. They're all very brilliant. They're all very great scientists. But okay, if someone's so. using telescope data, I think they're an astronomer. That's yeah. my my dividing line. That's a good that's a good way to do it, I suppose. But yeah, where would you put uh, the line? I wouldn't. I'd say they're the same. I, I ego. That's where I draw the line. I think. I think. <laughs> I think somebody wants to sound amazing, like you just said, you know, on an airplane, uh, or they want to impress somebody, they're going to say they're an astrophysicist. But, you know, really, they're just astronomers. And and I think both are equally cool. But astrophysicist has physicist in it. And we get all hot and bothered and moist when we think about physicists. So, you know, we think that's just the hardest thing in the world to do. So, and physicists yeah. feel that way about themselves, it's, too, it's right? Kind of, it, it is. It's kind of the modern form of, it's not rocket science. Theoretical mm -hmm. sort of carved out this niche between the Big Bang Theory and the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Every time there's a theoretical that's <laughs> on the screen, you know, like whether it's a rival with, uh, was it Jeremy Renner's character or in Bruce Banner and um, uh, Mark Ruffalo in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Throw the theoret or Lawrence Fishburne in Ant-Man. I could go on and on. They throw them at you because this is the person who makes magic happen and they are like your sage and you need them for plot reasons. That's and right. They occupy this this sort of sacred place in the sort of popular mind, but it's mostly ego. It is. I think it is anyway, because I, mean, I know the people who I've known, I, I've worked in the professional field for over 30 years. I've met hundreds and hundreds of professional astronomers, and I can tell you that the ones who, and they're also the ones that are going to insist that you call them doctor. And they're the ones, I'm doctor this, I'm, you know, this is my, you know, and you, they'll correct you over it. You know, so ego most definitely involved. I'm glad to see that you, but we, you, okay, we'll just say Matt Kaplan, Dr. Matt Kaplan is a theoretical physicist, astrophysicist studying white dwarfs because you don't use data, do you? You use models. I use code. Um, code. And ultimately it comes down to, you know, I can't do real science until an astronomer goes and prove me right or wrong. 
So, you know, there is symbiosis, like observers and theorists mm -hmm. meet on the same team. But I am squarely in the theory camp, even if we can't divide astronomy and astrophysics. I think we can divide experiment and theory pretty easily. Yeah, I've been on record as saying we don't need any more theorists. Sorry, I, 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 we, we don't need more theories. What we need are more data, more observations, more 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 information to weed out all of these theories out there because we've got so many that need to be tested and of course you only do that with as you say with mathematics and modeling that's one way to, to test out a theory but really the gold the holy grail is always going to be data and so if only data wasn't so expensive you know theorists i know, are, I know. <laughs> you just have to pay for my coffee and my salary but an experimentalist needs a billion dollars in space telescope you know yeah, and, and a career could you imagine being the guy who was at the design meeting for the new horizons probe to, to pluto right i mean they're sitting around a table deciding on this mission they gotta wait nine years before they even get to pluto so what are you I mean, gonna do in the meantime i don't yeah. know on the next probe yeah, exactly. So, I mean, careers are involved. People working on James Webb Space Telescope, think the same thing. They've been at this since it was first put in the one of the decadal surveys 20 years ago, right? They've been at this. And now they may finally, if we're all lucky, see a launch this year. So you really got to be patient to be an, a, a data-driven astronomer, I think. And you're right. It's very expensive. Absolutely. Okay. So I want to remind everybody, I am streaming on YouTube. <laughs> Thank you for finally working. Uh, Twitch. Uh, Twitter, I think I'm on Twitter. Who knows what happened with that platform? And um, Facebook. And uh, I think I'm on LinkedIn even. So maybe <laughs> we're streaming on LinkedIn, everyone. Welcome, professional astronomers. We just got through trashing you. But welcome to our humble stream. Okay. White dwarfs. Let's start. Now, you do a lot of research on this. We've talked about black dwarfs in the last Hangout, which to me are fascinating. We haven't seen any yet because they take the age of the universe and longer to, to, to make. But let's start at the basics for people who are catching this stream and didn't see the last one. White dwarf stars. Why don't you tell us what they are? Sure thing. So our sun is a grown-up adult main sequence star. Most of the stars that you see in the night sky are doing what the sun does. Uh, but it's going to run out of fuel. They shine from fusion in their cores, making hydrogen into heavier elements like helium. And eventually they'll swell into a giant phase, go through the, uh, the sort of later stages of burning. And the, the incredible heat that this makes in their core causes them to shed their outer layers. And what you get is a big planetary nebula surrounding this really white hot core of this dead star. And so what, what happens is that you then have this big cloud of mushy, you know, fluffy nonsense surrounding this tiny thing the size of the Earth but with the mass of the sun. And that is a white dwarf. It is the ember of the core of a star that is just going to sit there and be super hot for a while. Okay. So um, the there's a range of stars for which this is going to happen. The way in which a star usually dies is based primarily on how big the star is. So as you point out, stars about like our, about the mass of our sun will turn into well, within their lives as this, this stellar core, you this white dwarf star that is not fusing anymore, correct? Yeah, it's any star less than about 10 times the mass of the sun. And that's actually right. most stars. This is about 99 or more percent of the stars in the universe. And they don't have a heat source anymore. So it's almost like you've taken like a skillet and like heated it up on your burner on the oven and it's gotten real hot. It has all of this heat left over from when it was burning. And then you've taken it off the burner, you've turned the heat off. And so all of the heat in this white hot object is just the heat left over from when it was heated up as uh, you know, like the sun is now. So all they do after that is they just cool off and they spend the rest of eternity sort of dimming and, and slowly giving that heat off. Is it the core of the star that that's left? Or is it just all of the, what did not get shed into this planetary nebula collapsed down into this? Yes. Okay. It's, it's a combination of two steps is that the core uh, contracts, gravity pulls it together. And if it doesn't have fuel to burn, it will just keep contracting and getting hotter. And as a result, that heat is ultimately what pushes off the outer layers. So it's this combined effect of gravity contracting the core without anything to resist it. And then that heat pushing off the, all the material above it that gets you a white dwarf, which is made of heavy elements, which were the result of burning. So this is why white dwarfs are made of carbon, oxygen, neon, magnesium, is that is the burnt remains of the burning phase of the star's life. 
and because we don't get fusion out of this anymore, it has cooled and the, the pressure from that fusion has, has caused it to, to collapse. It just keep gravity keeps pulling it in. And because of this stellar mass range, you said up to 10 solar masses, 10 times the mass of our sun, it eventually stops. What stops it from falling against gravity? Would you believe me if I said electrons? I would. I would believe it's, you. Uh, it is called the Pauli exclusion principle. It's the same reason that electrons can't occupy the same states in an atom stops them from occupying the same quantum states in a white dwarf. And so you get this arrangement of electrons in a white dwarf, almost similar to like a giant atom where they pack in and this produces pressures as they fill these energy states, it produces a pressure which can then resist gravity. And that's when it stops contracting. And that gets you something that's, like I said a few minutes ago, the mass of the sun in a space about the size of the earth. And this thing is very hot, as you point out, leftover heat from a, billions of years of fusing, uh, hydrogen into helium and other things. Uh, and it is not incorrect, is it, to call this like a stellar ember. It's not burning anymore. It's just radiating leftover heat, right? Exactly. I always call them embers. I like ember. I like remnant. I like corpse. Corpse is really fun. It corpse. sounds like <laughs> I don't know if you're into metal the way I am, but, um, you know, I, I like a uh, corpse has this really kind of hardcore sound to it. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Corpse. Cadaver. Star killer. Oh, yeah. Star kill dead death. Yes. All of these things would, would apply. Um, I do like metal, but I don't think, uh, as much as probably you do. I, I like a lot of different things, but I, I like some metal, I guess I should say, but death or corpse is a good, a good one. And these things shine for, or I should say glow. Uh, for a very long, because shining kind of implies fusion, glow for a very long time. Uh, and when they do finally uh, die out, they will either do one of several things, as I understand it. You mentioned that there's all this leftover stuff, carbon, iron, heavy elements that are left over from this star fusing all this time. And it's sitting in the inside this corpse. Now, either this, the white dwarf will just D decay away into a black dwarf or it'll blow up let's talk about That's that basically yeah, those those are your two options what so, will cause it to blow up so that's the harder question if you just leave it to sit and cool off forever you get the black dwarf mm -hmm. but if you can trigger fusion of the light elements you can get what's known as a type 1a supernova so heavier stars, stars that are more massive than 10, 20 solar masses, uh, have enough gravitational pressure in their core to fuse heavier elements. And they can actually use the carbon and oxygen that's ash to one star as fuel. So just because the white dwarf can't fuse this doesn't mean another star can't, okay? So there, there's, there is fuel, it's just like not hot enough to burn it. So what if you can make a white dwarf hot enough to burn this, to burn this, uh, this fuel? that can make the entire star explode really abruptly. Uh, because it's at such high densities, the uh, explosions can sort of travel through it and consume all of this fuel very quickly and get you a supernova. So is this... This is where your research comes in. This is what we're here to talk about, how these how these uranium, what well, you posited that of these heavier elements, you, there's one of them is uranium. It's sitting around doing stuff. Could it be, could it few or f uh, not fuse, but um, trigger uh, the fusion, trigger a fusion reaction by, by fission of these, these uh, by, by, fi by fission of these atoms together. And, and so, but don't we already know what causes type 1A supernovae? You'd be surprised. We understand the core concept. We know that they are exploding white dwarfs. It's the, that's how we explain the, the products of the nuclear burning. Right. Carbon and neon will burn to make iron and nickel. So it makes sense that it's an exploding white dwarf. And we have examples that seem consistent with white dwarfs that were stealing matter from another nearby star, which caused them to explode. That's the conventional way of making a white dwarf explode. But there's a lot of exploding white dwarfs that are really weird and that just don't follow the patterns. They're either too dim or the way that their explosion sort of evolves doesn't look like the others. So white dwarf explosions seem to have a lot of variety and having variety in your observations suggests a variety in mechanisms for setting them off. Ooh, and that's kind of bad news for the whole standard candle idea, isn't it? 
I yeah. mean, one of the let's just talk about that for a minute. Tell us why type one A supernova are are such an important class of supernova, and the idea of a standard candle. Yeah. So. Type 1A supernova are really great because white dwarves, when they steal matter from a companion and explode that, that standard story, they are always exactly 1.4 times the mass of the sun. That's the maximum amount of mass that the electrons can support. So if you put too much matter on top of it, it ends up exploding as a consequence. So because of this, all of the type 1A explosions are the same in this very certain way. They have a sort of uh, luminosity. They have an intrinsic luminosity that is the same. And that means if you see one and you can tell how bright it is because of how much light is arriving at you on Earth, you can say, aha, I immediately know that the galaxy that it's in is that many millions of light years that way. And so just by measuring the brightness of this one thing, you can use it to measure distances because as we know in astronomy, you can't just point at a star and know how far away it is. It's like, is it is it close and, and dim or is it really far and really bright? So Type 1a supernova are this incredibly useful tool for measuring distances, and it also gets you the accelerating expansion of the universe. Right, which is why I was, I, these are such important uh, yardsticks, because it was the brightness of these type 1a supernovae that led astronomers to conclude that not only was the universe uh, not decelerating, but it was actually accelerating as it expanded. And that was a huge surprise to a lot of people. So if you, the way I always describe a standard candle is imagine you had a light bulb, a five watt light bulb right next to your eye. Well, you know how bright it is. It's five watts, but how, if you, if you then took it, I don't know, 20 feet away and measured its brightness, you would see that it maybe is some amount less than five watts and that distance and, and the way you would use the inverse square law to figure out how far away that is based on the difference in the two brightnesses. So this is by knowing how bright something really, really is, if you're right next to it, can tell you how far away it is when you look at its actual brightness through a telescope. It is not trivial to get distances in space. This is one of maybe three ways that we have it. Uh, and certainly only one of, I think, two ways that are that are possible for really, really far things, right? We use parallax for relatively close things, but right. there's this and then I, there's um, um, uh, a redshift, I think, to be also- And the redshift is completely derived from these type 1a supernova anyway. <laughs> right, so they're, they're kind of the same. This, everything is bootstrapped on everything else when it comes to astronomical distances. Okay, so these are incredibly important yardsticks. And if we're wrong about Super how important. bright type 1a supernovae are, then Adam Reese might have to give back his Nobel Prize. I'm kidding, he won't really. But, but you know, he won the Nobel Prize, or he and others won the Nobel Prize for this discovery of the accelerating expansion of the universe. Um, and, and, but if we don't have this down, then we're wrong about a great many other things. So, uh, so Matt, you, one of the things you wrote a paper on recently was about this idea of, hey, wait a minute, we've got all these leftover heavy metals, heavy elements sitting in a new, in a white dwarf star. Can they cause a supernova? Um, and so, talk a little bit about that and how that's sure different from what we just talked about about accreting white dwarfs and type. You one got it. So. Like you said, standard model for making a white dwarf explode is have it steal matter from a companion. So trying to make an isolated white dwarf explode is a lot harder because you're not going to be able to get the mass of the white dwarf up to 1.4 times the mass of the sun to get it to explode. So that way is out. Changing the mass of the star if you don't have anywhere to get new mass is, 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 is a huge problem if you want to make it explode. So the other way to make it explode is somehow make it really, really hot inside somehow, and that heat is enough to trigger the nuclear burning that would make the star then you know, detonate and explode. So how do you do that? Well, I have a crazy idea. <laughs> Before I tell you about my crazy idea, do you know where Gabon is, the country? I'm sorry, I don't. It's yeah, in it's West, too bad. I usually pride myself on my geography, but I don't know where that is. No, it's it's in West Africa, borders the Congo, sort of in the crook of the, the oh, okay. coast of Africa. It was a French colony, and they discovered rocks there uh, that were uranium ore. And in this uranium ore, they found a different ratio of uranium two thirty five, which is the stuff we use in nuclear reactors and bombs, and it's the stuff that can make a fission chain reaction. And uranium two thirty eight, it was this crazy, ridiculous difference that it seemed to be already missing 
it's a usable nuclear fuel because they were going to mine it to like build reactors and bombs. So this was terrifying in the 1960s. Yeah. Did somebody already mine this rock to steal the f uh, the fission fuel from it? And and if so, where is it? Where is the enriched uranium? And then they realized that it actually burned off naturally. Is that the uranium concentration in this ore was so high two billion years ago that it supported a fission chain reaction, just like in a, in a nuclear reactor. It was a naturally formed nuclear reactor in the ground that burned off a lot of its own fuel. Uh, a bit like, you know, imagine like if a, wow. a mine suddenly set fire or something a thousand years ago and burned off the coal. It's like that, but for uranium. So, so there's this idea that other people have had that fission and these critical assemblies can occur naturally. You don't need a billion dollars in the Manhattan Project and everybody- Centrifuges and all this. <laughs> centrifuges. You just need the right circumstances where you assemble a critical mass of fissile uranium. And I think you can get those conditions in the core of a white dwarf. I'm still, I'm still amazed that that, 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 that about the nuclear reaction in, in Africa. That's, that's amazing. So, um, we have these elements, so you're saying that already in the cores of these, uh, in the cores of these white dwarfs, we have we have some fissile material. You should. They and should. Mm. how ahead. would they would they look any? So let's say you're right that these that there's enough of this material that would eventually cause a supernova. If it's there to begin with, though, why doesn't it happen when the the white dwarf initially? forms right when you when the star dies the core what's left collapses into this white dwarf stage why doesn't the thing just start start uh, fusion or fizzing fizzing <laughs> um fissioning right away and then cause the supernova right then what's really what why question. why do we have this delay it's a really good question and this is one of the big parts of of the research the answer is pretty simple is you have to wait for the white dwarf to get cold enough to freeze uh how cold is that uh, it depends on the density, but it's it's hundreds of thousands of Kelvin. It's hot. Uh, it's just that the density is so high that in the, their cores, nuclei end up crystallizing into a lattice. And they basically get squeezed so close together, but they are so cold that they can't move past their neighbors anymore. And so they get locked into place and you make crystals. It's like a precipitate that, that can form. Is that inside the white dwarf, you... But the yeah. white dwarf has to cool to make those crystals. It has to cool. So you do have to wait millions, maybe a billion years after a white dwarf has, has you know, formed to, to get core crystallization. But it does happen. And we see it in nearby white dwarves now that their cores are actually freezing solid. And then the crystals form. And if there's enough of this uh, uranium, you would see then a... a, 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 a an atom bomb, we used to call them atom bombs, right? The, like the first ones we made in the in the 1940s, the first one yep. was a fission reaction. But then later we came up with hydrogen bombs, which required a, uh, which is an uncontrolled fusion reaction, but we needed to start it with a fission reaction. So something similar is happening here? Maybe, yeah. That's the yeah. basic idea is that the star is the fusion stage of the weapon. You're surrounded by carbon and oxygen, which can release energy from fusion but you might be able to trigger it with nuclear fission if the nuclear fission can get you hot enough. And that's really part of the key. It all comes down to temperature. Temperature is probably the most important thing in this entire problem. You need to get the star cold enough that nuclei are gonna lock into place with their neighbors and, and freeze. And the things that will do that first are going to be the heaviest. They will be nuclei with the highest electric charge. And it's because they have the strongest electric react interactions with, with their surroundings. And Uranium is actually the highest charge naturally occurring element. So the first thing to freeze would be uranium. It's like a precipitate. You have a, a column of, of fluid and you, as you cool it down, you would see like little snowflakes forming in it as, as the things that are dissolved in it start to sort of settle out and form little clumps. And that's what we think the uranium can do in the core of a white dwarf is we think uranium can form little tiny snowflakes by precipitating out and sort of freezing crystals together in the core of the white dwarf. And you said between one to two thousand Kelvin it needs to cool to. Um, I don't know the exact number off the top of my head because it depends on the density. But I it's see. it's it's about a billion years of cooling. Well, wait a minute. The density is not going to change that much because we're talking electron degenerate cores, right? I mean, they're going to be a certain density anyway. Somewhere around right? somewhere around 
uh, what's 10 to the eight? Is that a hundred million times the density of everything on earth? I don't know. sounds right. Yeah. It's, it's somewhere around, I think hundreds of thousands of Kelvin. It's still hilariously hot. Uh, but, um, okay. You know, compared, compared to the density of the surroundings, that temperature is, is kind of nothing. Uh, it, it might as well be absolute zero as far as the star is concerned. Okay. So how could we test this? W and would your supernova, if you're right, that these that these uranium lattices form and uh, precipitate a type 1a supernova with their fission explosions, um, what would this look any different? And would we, would we be able to tell by looking at a type 1a supernova if you're right or not? What observational evidence would Good we Good question. Be oh, thank you. Good, good question. <laughs> Next question. Okay. Okay, no, so we would so, so we would be able to tell. I'm, I'm I'm actually serious that this is a really good question, and this is not something I'm able to answer because that's okay. not kind of my areas. I, I worked on this one problem because I study white dwarf interiors, but I have a lot of friends who make their careers out of studying type one A supernova explosions and their mechanisms. Mm -hmm. and I'm hoping to do in the next few months is get some of them to run simulations of the nuclear burning inside white dwarves, these little popcorn things that they sort of have these explosions and plumes of gas that start to burn. And I want them to run simulations like this to see if these little sparks can trigger the fusion. And if they can, what might this look like? For example, these white dwarves wouldn't have to be 1.4 times the mass of the sun. Maybe they could be a little bit less. And would a less massive white dwarf explode differently than a more massive white dwarf? And these are things that people haven't really thought too much about because there haven't really been ways to make low mass white dwarves explode before. So the answer to your question is I have no idea and I don't think anybody has any idea, but we're hoping to answer these questions in the next year or two because we're really excited about this idea. We, we think that there's there's a, a, a lot of opportunity for, for new science. Well, I, I guess I, uh, I'm trying to, I'm by no means any kind of spectroscopy expert, but I'm trying to figure out, could you pick out the fission explosion that that precipitated the type 1a in in some kind of way and i guess i guess you maybe could it's might it might be the one of those things where it's like the difference between looking at a the the flux from a star and trying to find the reflection of the exoplanet nearby right the yeah. signal is so close to the noise or so far yeah. down in the noise you may not be able to i don't know so i'll tell you that the, the critical mass of the snowflake is a microgram it's the mass of a grain of sand so this little trigger, it, it would be like trying to figure out if somebody set off, you know, a mountain of dynamite with a cigarette butt or with a match or with a lighter. <laughs> you're just, you're not going to be able to figure it out. Yeah. Gonna, I get... There might be other signatures. Um, okay. But for a white dwarf star that isn't around a companion, we, we need this, right? We need something like this. Right, because otherwise we don't ever get type one A supernovae. Otherwise it's, you don't get a type one A supernova. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So and of all so I think is it true that all of the type one A supernovae that we currently observe, this is assumed that somewhere along the way there's an there's a companion feeding this thing to one point two solar masses and boom, off it goes. Pretty um, much, pretty much hundred yeah, percent. Okay. Yeah. This is just taken for granted that we at least know this one way that they can explode. Mm -hmm. so we kind of assumed they all explode this way. But you know, we're, we're not sure. And if there was ever a counterexample, if suddenly there was a white dwarf that we know in the Milky Way that we've already seen and photographed, and then suddenly it exploded and we looked at our old pictures and we went, hey, wait a minute, that white dwarf didn't have a companion. That was an isolated lone white dwarf that exploded for seemingly no reason. That How would did that happen? Gun. How did that happen? But yeah. it hasn't happened yet. And, you know, it takes a, a century or longer to, to get a supernova in a galaxy. So we're probably not going to be lucky enough to to figure it that way yeah so that would be yeah that would it, it's it seems so tenuous that we're well, first of all it also seems a little bit wrong that we're just assuming all of these type 1a supernovae have occurred the same way you said earlier in the in the hangout that we see a range of we see some white or uh, type 1a supernovae that are weird explosions can you describe can you describe the differences? Like what are the range of things that we see in these kinds of explosions? Or was yeah. it white, white dwarfs you said were weird? Something you said there was a range of- The, the explosions. Some it, okay. explosions seem to have less than 1.4 solar masses of ejected material. So there's a lot of guesses about why a white dwarf could explode and make like a low energy supernova and not produce enough blowout 
Um, it's not, maybe it just leaves behind some of the star and like half the mass is still in the star. Maybe there was like really incomplete burning for some reason and that like it only exploded out half the star and then stopped. There's, there's weird ideas. Um, and, and I'm not even, this is, I don't even have the weirdest idea. Some people have argued that maybe tiny black holes streaming through the galaxy have punched through the white dwarf. And oh, for God's sakes. Heated, <laughs> and the gravitational compression from having the black hole pass through heated the material in the white dwarf enough to make it explode. So lots of people have, you know, their own personal favorite theoretical way to, to blow up a white dwarf. Oh, come on. I mean, there's a lot of black holes that we haven't seen for sure, because black holes without you know, any sort of effect on the surroundings are certainly going to be uh, impossible to see, but come on, I don't think there's that many, but who knows? Yeah, but, uh, but you gotta, you gotta think about it because otherwise you never know. I know, I know, but I like your idea better because at least there's a, there's a plausible mechanism here that all white dwarfs have. <coughs> all white dwarfs are going to have uranium, yeah, right? Right. You know, every exactly. star is formed from the ashes of previous stars. So the sun is full of every element. Everything we find on Earth, we find in the sun. We find uranium, we find iron, we find gold in small amounts. You know, it's not as common as hydrogen and helium, but it's still there. So if a supernova or a neutron star merger goes off and spreads uranium through the galaxy, that uranium is going to be mixed into that next generation of stars that form. So every white dwarf should be chocked full of uranium, especially if the formation of that white dwarf was triggered by gas being compressed by another explosion. You know, one of the best ways to make stars is to kill previous stars. Shockwaves compress the gas, and that compressed gas can be pulled together by gravity to, to make the next generation. Okay, well, that's a good point, because we've always learned in like Astronomy 101 that most of the heavier elements, we are made of, you know, star stuff, all that stuff you always hear about. All the heavier, element, ele heavier elements are made in the life cycles of stars, but when it comes to fusion, uh, we pretty much stop at iron. So all of those things after that don't get made in stars where they are, uh, uh, they are coming, as you just reminded me from other dead stars and they're accreting and sitting there in their own life cycle. They're not being created in the star as it feels. Right, they're being created in, in the death of the star. It's only when you have extra energy to assemble them, uh, up to iron, everything less massive than iron, you can actually get energy out from burning it. And that's mm -hmm. why stars are able to burn up to iron is because they use it as fuel. But past iron, you need to actually put energy back into it in order to then add more protons and neutrons to the nucleus and assemble something larger. So it takes these really energetic explosions that get really hot and make a lot of neutrons to cram together enough protons and neutrons to make something like gold or uranium. So they do only come from the really most energetic environments. And uh, so for a white dwarf to have any of these things, it would had to have gotten them from the deaths of other more massive stars, supernovae, and the influx of energy that creates them. Uh, and then it just sits there in that star pretty much throughout its lifetime, right? And then we got it. And then when the star dies, these are gentle deaths, by the way, comparatively speaking, a white dwarf is like basically turning off a switch, right? It's just a very quiet little way, even though our sun's going to die this way. As stars deaths go, it's pretty low key, right? Poofs out a little, all of its outer layers. Poof, out they go. They're very pretty. It's and very, very pretty, a very, very flower, elegant. lovely. We get all these ring nebulae and things like that. And then we just are sitting about with this leftover iron or electron degenerate core. So it's all that it would have, had stuff in from the, its whole lifetime. Wouldn't have ejected any of it until it did the type 1A supernova thing. So that's really interesting to think about. So this is one of the only kind of stellar cores that's going to have this crystalline structure of these heavy elements in it. Do would not, a neutron would a neutron star be able to have this stuff or is it too dense? Do neutron stars have crystals? Do they have these uranium like yeah, heavy metal crystals? Actually, yeah, and, and this is the other half of my job, is I spend half my time thinking about white dwarfs and the other half thinking about neutron stars. You're just Be a degenerate astronomer. That's what I'm, you are. I'm absolutely, I'm a complete degenerate. <laughs> um, I love to use that term. <laughs> it's, it's because as you go deeper, I talk a lot about density. The deeper you go in a star and the more mass you have above you, the more compressed you're going to be and the higher the density uh, your matter is going to be at. So a neutron star has outer layers that are very similar to the cores of white dwarfs. And in fact, if you go from the very top of a neutron star down about a kilometer, 
you pass through about a kilometer thick layer of crust, very similar to the earth. There is a crystalline solid that the gravity is so high that it creates so much pressure that that outermost 10% of the neutron star is, is a crystalline solid, just like in, in white dwarfs. And this makes all sorts of fun phenomena in neutron stars. You know, you could have crust breaking. There can be star quakes the same way we have earthquakes on earth. And this can make big explosions from pulsars. It doesn't destroy the pulsar, but it, it's these very energetic, uh, you know, magnetic events that can happen. Uh, so neutron stars have really rich uh, crystallography, to put it uh, in a word. Oh, cool. Okay. Well, um, I wish, what, well, what, well, you don't know, because you're not an observational astronomer. I want to find out about what kind of telescope you'd like to get built, but I guess you don't really know because you don't know what, what a bigger you one? look for. A bigger one. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, we all, that's the answer to every astronomer's question, you know, wish list. What kind of telescope do you want? A big one. The big I'll tell you, I'm, I talk to enough observers because I try not to be the crazy theorist who makes things up. You know, if you're a good theorist, you keep in touch with, with what the observers have been seeing. That's why you're not a string theorist. Thank you for not exactly. being a string theorist. Yes. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> I do this all for you, Tony. I think I know you do. Thank you. I appreciate it. I hate it's, string theory. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> so sucks. I, I, I try to talk to a lot of observers to, to keep, you know, finger on the pulse of what, what's coming up, what are they doing? And, you know, with the end of Hubble coming soon and Spitzer, the mm. Spitzer Space Telescope was our, our infrared space telescope. It's been offline for, I think it's a year now. Uh, right around the start of the pandemic, we lost, yeah. uh, it was decommissioned, it was its time. But we're now coming up on a time where if, when Hubble is retired, and if the James Webb Space Telescope isn't up, we could be blind to a chunk of wavelengths in the infrared that would otherwise, you know, it'd be impossible to see because it doesn't get to the Earth's surface. So I really want to see the James Webb get launched. And if we can be greedy, I want to see bigger, badder, gravitational wave observatories. I know people don't think of LIGO as being an observatory like a telescope, but it's an observatory all the same. It sees things from really far away. Admittedly, it's hearing them by listening to space time. It's a little different, but they are observing the cosmos and they're discovering things about neutron stars and black holes. And I want a bigger, badder gravitational wave detector. No, I, I, amen. So Lisa, for sure. But yeah, that's a good way to put it. Listening to space time. I like that because that's what it is. It's an acoustic way. Well, not acoustic way. Mm -hmm. It's a gravitational wave of the fabric of space and time. I love that. I'm going to, I'm going to use that. Um, all right. So I, I'm going to, let's get to a couple. So I saw some questions here in the chat. Let me get to a few here. Um, I'm scroll back up. Oh yeah. Here's the one I was looking at. Chris Georgie is asking, so what happens when the electron degeneracy pressure begins to give way to neutron degeneracy, do we see nuclear transmutation due to neutron formation? So I hope this, you understood that. Yeah, this is kind of the core collapse supernova mechanism, right? If you squeeze something too hard that the electrons can't support it, you are going to generally cause those electrons to get smushed into the protons and that's going to make neutrons and that very abruptly causes your matter to sort of change form and it ceases to be made of nuclei and it becomes made of a sort of soup of, of neutrons with some protons and electrons thrown in. So ultimately, yeah, overcoming electron degeneracy pressure is the thing that gets you neutrons, which then supports neutron degeneracy pressure. Yeah. Um, and I'm reading, here's, Gala here's a comment from Galaxia. A red dwarf star is smaller than the sun. It is hot, less hot and radiates mainly in the infrared. And because they're cooler and they look more reddish, uh, they live for several trillion years. That's right. And, um, and other stars, uh, like supermassive stars, they would live, say, tens of millions or hundreds of millions of years. Um, yeah, I think this was an answer to someone else in the chat, but I noticed this early yeah. on. Some people, we use dwarfs. To, to answer a question that, that maybe wasn't asked was that dwarf is one of the most misused words in astronomy. Really? We have brown dwarfs, we have red dwarfs, we have white dwarfs, and we just use it to mean things that aren't big and bright and exciting for some reason. But red dwarfs are stars that are just kind of low mass. White dwarfs are dead stars. And brown dwarfs are kind of planets like Jupiter. It's just this kind of word that gets tacked onto anything based on its sort of color or temperature. Uh, it's not as well-defined as maybe star or planet might be. 
And it's very squishy boundaries too, because I don't know that there is a real difference between a brown dwarf and a uh, uh, a red dwarf star. I mean, they're very, you know, I guess a certain amount of a certain amount of um, illumination must have to occur People, to, for that to happen. But I don't know. In in my uh, in my social circles, when we argue about this one. Uh, the the boundary that I think people like the most for brown dwarf, red dwarf, is red dwarfs can fuse um, properly, right? Is they can actually have proper fusion in their core, whereas brown dwarfs, it's it's very limited. But these things are on such a spectrum, right? Slow mm -hmm. increasing any difference in temperature gives you, you know, very slightly different burning. The formation history, if you form more quickly, you can have a hotter core. So it's very fuzzy boundaries. Uh, it's it's a bit like arguing whether a virus is alive. It's like, well, we sort of, if we know what a virus is, does it matter? Yeah, yeah, okay. So um, here's another question. Uh, this is from Grizzy Watch, um, from Twitch. Uh, I must have missed it, but where's the uranium supposed to come from in the core? We talked about that a little bit, but go ahead and say Yeah, that. And, and you know what, I, I like this question, even though we did talk about it, because <clears throat> there's a lot that has to happen before you get a snowflake, right? You first need uranium to form in like a neutron star merger, and then it needs to be mixed into the gas, which will eventually form the white dwarf. So the uranium was always there to begin with, but then you also need to get the uranium into the core of the white dwarf. You don't want it just all mixed through the star. You want to get more of it deeper in the star so that you have more uranium for fission reactions. And it actually sinks in the same way that rain falls on earth. Uranium is heavier than all of the surrounding nuclei. And so it sinks because, well, it's it's denser, right? So like a rock sinks in water, oil floats. Uh, the same thing happens in a white dwarf is the immense gravity acts like a, a centrifuge to separate things based on their densities. So more dense materials actually sink to the core as well. And that'll enrich uranium, iron, heavy elements in the cores of, of white dwarfs. Uh, let's see. Here's another comment from um, who know me. Uh, the the iron is produced only is only produced when the sun explodes. There's no iron on the sun right now, right? I don't think we're going to see fusion of iron in many stars, are we? Yeah, if if your star is fusing iron, you have killed that star. <laughs> iron is poison. Iron is the ash that lets you undergo a uh, a, a supernova. Right. And Christian Reddy, Launchpad Astronomy, uh, neutron capture fusion, correct? I'm not quite sure what that. Oh man, when when did he ask that? That could have been about. Uh, oh, it's about uh, about five six minutes ago. Yeah, I, so, I guess we were talking about heavy element formation, right? Yeah. Uh, the the energy ultimately in heavy element formation makes neutrons. Neutrons are more massive than protons, so the only way to actually make things more massive than iron is to start throwing neutrons at them until they capture the neutron and then the neutron decays away to a proton. So this is actually your trick for building things like uranium, is to have huge numbers of neutrons in neutron star mergers, for example. Right. Um, here's one from One Clown Shoe. How was quantum mechanics involved in a black hole ejecting matter? Okay, that's not quite what we're talking about here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, so... Um, we're going to get to that one in another hangout, but right now we're talking about white dwarf stars and, uh, and uranium accretion. So, um, yeah, good, good. If you get somebody who does black holes and Hawking radiation for a living, I probably don't know too much more about Hawking radiation than, uh, you know, your average, uh, your average astronomer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's see. Here's another one. I'm just pushing things now. If Sausalito, if gravity is space pushing and not gravity pulling, what exactly are gravitational waves? Well, since we brought it up, why don't you go ahead and take that one? Yeah. So I like to think of gravitational waves a lot like ripples in water. When you put a stick in the surface of a lake and you sort of drag it around, uh, you make ripples that will sort of come off of it. Space, time, and matter interact very similarly to the surface of that, that lake and, and the massive object being the stick. So gravity is, is a lot more than just everything attracts, right? Gravity is, is what is happening in that, that space-time. And so if you wiggle something, you can actually make space-time wiggle because you have made sort of wiggling gravity by wiggling your object. 
So gravitational waves are the wiggling in space-time caused by the wiggling of mass. And I say wiggling, but I just mean sort of moving back and forth, black holes orbiting each other, um, neutron stars spinning, these things that have immense amounts of mass being very lumpy and sort of moving through space is, is dragging the space with it, like the thick dragging the water to make those ripples. And I don't think Einstein, I mean, I can't, I'm, I, this is just something I happen to remember in my head, but I could have it wrong. I don't think Einstein ever fully expected to be able to detect anything like this, certainly not in his lifetime, but when, when, when relativity, this is a consequence of his theories, right? Of his ideas of the curvature of space and time. And, um, but what this does is now that we can see these things, it, gravitational waves, we have now an entirely new window to the universe that we didn't have before. Uh, before, you know, we were limited by the electromagnetic spectrum and getting feeble photons from the distant reaches of space to fall on our detectors. And from that, we have gained a lot of knowledge about the universe, no question. But here now, this is all, this is, and prior to that, this was, this has all been in the electromagnetic arena. But now we have something outside of that, so a completely independent way of looking at the interaction of things with mass to the cosmos and to each other. And we can learn a lot about um, not only uh, the nature of things like neutron stars when they collide or black holes when they collide, but we're going to be able to see a whole lot of, get a lot of new information about our cosmos as a result of this. So it is nothing less than, than, uh, what I think um, I forgot the guy who wrote the uh, uh, um, the book on scientific revolutions, but you know the way we had this big paradigm oh, shift. Right? Yeah, yeah Kuhn is the guy I'm thinking of. Yeah, uh, uh, not Jeff Kuhn. He's a friend of mine. But but I have the book back here on my on my bookcase. But uh, the art of scientific revolution. Behind you, I don't see any bookcases. It's I know. Yeah, that's because I've got green screen going here. But I, I use, behind that is my bookcases. Uh, and there's this uh, the structure of scientific revolutions. That's the name mm -hmm. of the book. And in it is this paradigm shift where science kind of goes in, in leaps and bounds, <laughs> uh, fits and starts sort of. And, and these, these ideas, um, are brought about by new technology. Some really smart people like Einstein come along. We get these fits and starts of, 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 of advancement of science. And this is a, an example of an area of science that has been advanced by our technology built on the work of Einstein and relativity. So this is, a, everybody's excited about this, the fact that we can do it. There is a space antenna being built called LISA, which is designed to be way more sensitive to these gravitational waves. Right now we have three, I think, ground-based observatories uh, that LIGO, comprise LIGO, uh, mm -hmm. two in the United States and one in Italy, I believe. And they all are contributing to this knowledge. So uh, gravitational waves is the future. If you're a young guy wondering, wanting to get into astronomy and you want to decide on a career path, this is wide open. That and exoplanets and exobiology or astrobiology. It really is. I mean, it, it isn't that amazing? Is. The, the first gravitational wave event was, was out of left field. You know, they turned on the detectors to do some debugging and all of a sudden there were like 30 solar mass black holes that were merging. And nobody had ever seen black holes that massive before. And now they've seen like a hundred of these things merge. And it was an entire population nobody knew existed. And it's just these, these big discoveries. And sometimes they just come all at once and they slap you in the face. And, they, and the discovery says to you, where have you been looking all these years that you missed us? Um, it's, it's, there's so many cool and exciting things. Exoplanetary science, like, you know, undergoing a renaissance. Gravitational waves is undergoing a renaissance. Even outside of space physics, there's like biophysics, you know, nanoengineering, all of these things where we're manipulating individual atoms and materials. Uh, who cares about string theory when you've got all of this other cool stuff that's like happening and that you can, in some cases, hold in your hand? Uh, yeah, and, and the advances in... And even the advances in quantum mechanics, the the practical uses of quantum mechanics. There's something that used to be an oxymoron, right? You did there were uh, quantum mechanics was something that you know you didn't really bring to the real practical world because you know these all dealt in probabilities and the very fine things. But now we've got we're working on quantum computing and yeah. and we're playing around with simultaneity and 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 all of these other things. So. Um, yeah, the fact I would love to get into a conversation. Oh, yeah, you're, a young, you're a young career scientist, and I'd love to get your thoughts on the state of science and in particular astronomy. Um, but we don't have time for that right now. So I guess I'll just I'll just ask you what what got you into your 
I consider you early career scientist because you're young, you're energetic, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're willing to interact with us. <laughs> that, that by there makes you. I'm uh, not scared of Zoom and the internet. Sure. Exactly right. All these inner tubes. Uh, what, it, what, give us your impression of the field of astronomy as it sits now. Are you, uh, what got you into it, I guess? So why am I doing this? Um, I am probably, uh, is, is like young as you can be to have grown up the way these kids these days are growing up. I had YouTube, you know, as a kid, uh, I was raised on it. And YouTube's very different that now, you know, there wasn't streaming. Tell me about it. Yeah. There wasn't the capacity for that, but it was, it was clips of John Stewart, family guy, Carl Sagan, Neil deGrasse Tyson. And, and they suck you in, right? I watched these videos and they were so cool. And now I've like made half a career out of making some of those videos myself. And I just, I never, I never put it down. I always just kept watching videos on the internet. And then it was time to go to college. And I was like, well, what am I going to major in? Well, I, I guess these people are astronomers or maybe they're physicists. I'm not really sure, but I should major in one of those two things. And I just, I never stopped. And then I blinked and now I'm a professor and I have, you know, bills to pay, but at least I get to do this, you know, for a living. It's uh, yeah. it's, it's not many people are lucky enough to, to just get to think about big questions for their job. Well, I worked at the uh, University of Illinois astronomy department for two and a half years. I was part of the uh, dark energy survey there when it was just getting started. And um, at the time, I don't remember ISU having uh, a very big astronomy department. Has it grown in the, in the, time since, I don't know, that would, that would have been there between 2007 and 2010. Would have Illinois been State? I was not Illinois, no, I was, at, I was at U of I, but, right. but I, I remember, you know, that Illinois State, I was there a few times. I don't remember there being a very uh, large astronomy department, but I could have had that wrong. I am the astronomy department. Oh. Uh, I'm, I'm in the physics. growing. I'm the one sort of space scientist, I would say, in the okay. does this. Okay. Well, so that's good. Any students in Illinois or the Great Lakes area that are, you know, looking to major in physics, you should totally apply to Illinois State University because uh, we have the best faculty in the Department of Physics. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> and and if you you know, we need to get a handle. I think this is important work on this Type One A supernova business. So if nuclear fission is a precursor to some type 1a supernovae we should know we need to know that and so uh and and so the matt the work that matt's doing you should get involved if you're considering i can't i can't do it on my own i need help right. i need friends right. so all come right. be a physicist there you go. all right guys uh all right well matt thank you for your time i really appreciate you taking time pleasure out pleasure being here anytime time. yep and well i'm sure we'll have you back we'll talk some more about stuff in the future and Absolutely. on behalf of uh so on behalf of Matt Kaplan, I'm Tony Darnell. Thank you all so much for watching. Don't forget to check out Tony's Twitch Tuesdays. I'm going to leave it to you to find out what day of the week that is uh, uh, at 3 o'clock Eastern time uh, and also what platform it is. Tony's Twitch Tuesdays, 3 o'clock on that uh, in that area. So um, have, I hope you guys have a good weekend. Uh, and thank you all so very much for watching. And always, don't, and always remember, don't ever forget the best part of waking up is Folgers in your cup. <laughs> I do that now because I used to always say, keep looking up. But then we started having different catchphrases, and that's the latest one. The best part of waking up is Folgers in your cup. Have a great weekend, everybody. Talk to you later. <laughs>